Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest is Robert J. Lifton, who is Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry at John Jay College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. For more than 40 years as a writer, investigator, and psychiatrist, he has used the skills of a researcher and the imagination of a healer of the mind to confront some of the most disturbing events of our times. As a witness, he analyzes how men and women lose and recreate their humanity in extreme situations. Hiroshima, the Holocaust, the Vietnam War, and now terrorist cults. These are the territory of Robert J. Lifton's explorations as he probes the profound questions of death and its meaning for life. Robert J. Lifton is the author of many important works, including the Nazi Doctors, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and Death and Life, winner of a National Book Award. He also wrote Home from the, Front, Home from the War, Neither Executioners Nor Victims. His latest book is Destroying the World to Save It, Aum Shirinko, Apocalyptic Violence and the New Global Terrorism. Uh, Professor Lifton, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. You wrote uh, several years back, we may say that every insight expressed by a healer or investigator, every use of the eyes of the understanding is a function of his own formative place, of all that goes into his special relationship to history. Uh, where were you born and raised, to follow up on uh, I'm a, a Brooklyn boy. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and raised there. And, uh, spent most of my childhood there. And, and how did your parents shape your character, do you think? Well, very importantly, uh, my parents were second generation. They were born in America, but barely. That is, their parents had been born in shtetls in Russia. And uh, my father, in particular, was uh, a progressive person, a person who made his way in the society by attending the City College of New York. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting that I've somehow made my way back to mm -hmm. City University, which is an outgrowth of the City College. But he stood for progressive principles that I think uh, affected me, and the people around me and my family were, were concerned with these issues. And what books did you read as a young person that you recall today? I don't have the feeling that as a very young person I read some books that absolutely um, made their mark on my mind. As a kid, I was fascinated with sports, <laughs> and I love sports more than anything else. And the first books I read were about sports, like books about Baseball Joe, as <laughs> one baseball hero w was called. And uh, as a matter of fact, I remember as a kid feeling that almost all that adults did was boring, because it didn't have a ball or some kind of <laughs> sports play. And actually, um, this kind of imagery is still very much in my mind and is part of whatever mental or creative process I may have expressed. Uh, later, uh, maybe when I got into my early teens, I did become interested very much in history. I read Shirer about the Third Reich and various books about contemporary history. And now, in retrospect, uh, you know, Freud once said that he spent all of his professional life making his way back to his original interest, which mm -hmm. was ancient cultures. Well, uh, I could say that I, spent a, I have spent a good deal of my professional life making my way back to what was at least a very early interest, that of history and the historical process. And, and that is something that, that becomes an important component in your work, as does uh, studies of the mind and of the healing process. Well, that's right. I mean. Uh, my work, although I didn't call it this at the very beginning, fits into something we call psychohistorical or psychohistory, mm -hmm. and that can be very mystified, but what it really means is simply the application of psychological methods to historical questions, and just about all of my studies fit into that category. Now, what were, the, were there, you were 19, I believe I read, when the World War II ended. Were there formative events in history that you recall from the, these years we're, we're discussing? Well, you know, uh, I, I've publicly in my writing made a confession, which in a sense I've been trying to live down ever since. Uh, when I heard about the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and then Nagasaki, especially the first one, uh, 
I was stunned but pleased because I thought it would end the war and then I wouldn't have to go and other people wouldn't have to go and America would win a glorious victory. Later I felt very ashamed of that kind of feeling, but I feel it's necessary to mention because of the attraction that large-scale destruction can have if it seems to be on your side and for what we take to be virtuous purposes. That certainly had an enormous impact. I think that all of World War II had an enormous impact on me because at that time the Nazis were very much uh, in my lenses, uh, all the more so as a Jew. And I had the idea, as many people had at that time, that our government and our country stood for decency and progressive policies, uh, an idea that most of us have lost over the decades. That was all very important for me. At the same time, I, I think I got from my parents and my father in particular a, a kind of critical sense that uh, the government and people in power can do wrong things that one should contest. That was a very early feeling of mine. And also a, a sense of ethics, because that, that is a, another recurring theme in your work. It's very hard to gauge for me exactly how a sense of ethics developed. Um, it wasn't out of any religious conviction. Um, again, I was influenced by my father who was um, very much an atheist and took pride in uh, combating uh, the uh, traditional or orthodox forms of Judaism which his parents and which my mother's parents were very steeped in. And I must say that that orthodoxy felt very suffocating to me as a kid growing up and witnessing it, though not really entering into it. So, uh, uh, yet I do think there was an ethical idea about human beings and who ought to be treated well. It was very vague in that sense, in a secular form, very early on. It has remained secular in me, I think, ever since, mm -hmm. and yet it has some spiritual component. Were, were you shocked uh, when you learned of the Holocaust in, in the aftermath of World War II, as we all did? I was enormously shocked. and. Um, I think that families like my own that were middle class uh, had complicated feelings, almost guilty feelings, that we were so privileged uh, in not having undergone any of that ordeal um, and at the same time terrified and outraged because it was directed at Jews like ourselves and uh, the Holocaust was there. Uh, it, it wasn't talked about a lot in my family as it was happening. Uh, maybe we didn't want to know it was happening, but later on, soon after the war, uh, I remember seeing pictures that were shocking and doubly so that people were murdered this way because they were Jewish as I was. And, and you did uh, undergraduate work and then you chose to go to medical school and you became a psychiatrist. Actually. That's right. Uh, when I was young, I was very unclear about what I wanted to do. I was interested in history. I didn't know where that would take me. Um, I had a kind of interest in medicine and had read early on some books about healers of the mind, as they were called, and so I had an early but somewhat vague interest in, uh, in both medicine and in what was to become in my mind and in my work, psychiatry. But I was rushed through my early education uh, because a lot of it was during the war. And um, yet I was always a very intense student, interested in my work and, and very committed to it. But um, spent just two calendar years at Cornell University, mm -hmm. um, though it was covering more than three years of work, uh, and then went to medical school and did become interested in psychiatry and uh, even help form a kind of psychiatry club in medical school. Sometimes it's said that um, psychiatrists are doctors who are uh, frightened by the sight of blood. <laughs> I might have fallen into that category. Uh, I, I never quite envisioned myself a proper doctor under that white coat, mm -hmm. but I was interested in, in the idea of healing and in, in the psychological dimension rather early on. And, and to, to follow through on your career before we uh, talk about the actual work you wound up doing, 
uh, you went into the army, and that that sort of changed the course of your life in a way. Tell us about that. Very much so. Um, when I was still in my psychiatric resi residency training in New York City, um, uh, I was subjected to the doctor draft of that time uh, during the early 50s, uh, at the time of the Korean War, and. Um, I was called up by my draft board and I was sent first to um, West, Westover Field in Massachusetts. But then uh, there was a request for somebody to be sent overseas and I was the one who was selected to be sent overseas. And of course, like a red-blooded young American lad, I asked to be sent to Paris. They sent me to Japan and then quickly to Korea. Uh, it, it, it may sound terrible, but I, I often say that um, the military saved me from a conventional life in the United States and I've never really thanked them for it because I haven't exactly been pro-military in my in my work but uh, I did make wonderful discoveries when living in Japan for almost a year and a half with my wife and in immersing ourselves in Japanese life we never lived on the base we lived uh, in among uh, Japanese groups and families um, formed groups with them, especially a discussion group where we met a lot of young Japanese students who later became ambassadors and leading mm -hmm. figures in Japanese life and uh, really were drawn to Japan and to the world. Uh, and the other thing that happened was that my last military assignment, this was the Air Force that I had enlisted in in order to avoid being drafted as a, as a private. Mm -hmm. and, and of course I only practiced medicine or psychiatry in the Air Force, so uh, I was never in any kind of uh, violent combat. But um, my last assignment, I was sent back to Korea to interview along with other Air Force and Army psychiatrists, GIs returning from North Korea where they had been in Chinese Communist custody and had been put through a process that we later came to call thought reform, which is a direct translation of what they call their process. And that interested me in this process. It was also called brainwashing in a more casual way. Uh, and so when my wife and I had decided to take a trip around the world after I was discharged from the military, we only reached our second stop, which was Hong Kong, when I began to hear stories of people subjected to more intense version of this process. And I managed to arrange to get some research support and to stay in Hong Kong for another year and a half uh, interviewing people coming out of China, both Westerners and Chinese, and uh, that was my first real research study on thought reform or so-called brainwashing. Now, uh, you, uh, to talk about your research, uh, we, we could actually work on several planes here, but, but uh, throughout your work, you're looking at the psychological tendencies common to all mankind. You give special, em those especially that give special emphasis within a particular cultural tradition, and then finally those stimulated by contemporary historical forces. So it, it's a, an interesting mixture of culture, of history, and the psychology of the individual. Well, what I found was when I started my first study and then in subsequent studies is uh, here you have people under some kind of duress or I chose to study them because they represented some kind of historical event mm -hmm. as it impacted on them or as they helped to create it. Uh, say survivors of Hiroshima were in a sense caught up in a certain historical process. As you studied them, uh, you know, who, who were they? How did you get your sense of who they were, and I began to think through, uh, influenced by various anthropologists, some of whom I got to know, like Margaret Mead, who was very supportive in my work, her work and Ruth Benedict's work, and, uh, and then later on Eric Erickson's work in psychoanalysis. And so I came to what was, for me, a kind of obvious three-partite, tripartite idea. Uh, they were creatures of the immediate historical process that had brought me to them uh, mm -hmm. at the same time of a cultural tradition and a long cultural history which made them the kind of people they were in many ways and they were human beings uh, we'd, and in that sense had universal psychobiological struggles and, and, and that's been a, a rough kind of uh, uh, model for ways of looking at people in different cultures that I've studied because I've looked at people in Japan uh, from China and Chinese experience, uh, 
in Germany, in the United States, and, and this kind of approach applies in all cases. And, and, and these cases that you've looked at, whether Vietnam veterans, Hiroshima survivors, Nazi doctors, and now uh, terrorist cults, it's really individuals in extreme circumstances. That's right. Uh, and why that are, focus? Why that focus, do you think? Um, you know, it's hard to, it would be, I think it would be easy to say, well, that's very important for us to know and that's why I did it. But that's not the way it happens. It happens in a much more uh, erratic way and you find yourself doing certain things. Um, I did the first study because I had been exposed to something import that I took to be important and interesting, uh, mm -hmm. this thought reform process uh, in the military, and then I saw a chance to study it unencumbered by any military limitations. Uh, and I did that, and I thought that work was, was interesting for me and useful to the world. And then um, my second main study uh, came after I'd spent quite a lot of time in Japan studying Japanese youth, and I just decided to make a trip to Hiroshima with my wife, who was with me, uh, to look into what happened in that city. And this would be about what year? Uh, this was um, 1962. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did that. It isn't that I became, say, anti-nuclear because I learned what was going on and what happened in Hiroshima. It was kind of the reverse. Mm -hmm. I had been at Harvard for a number of years, and I became uh, a close friend of David Reisman, a great sociologist, who was the first American faculty person to be an advisor to an anti-nuclear group, and we formed a little newsletter that he mostly did talking about the American shelter-building craze and some of the absurdities of strategic declarations about winning and fighting and winning nuclear war. Better red than dead was the All that, popular, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the favorite moral questions of that time was, if you saw your neighbor coming to your shelter mm -hmm. where he might use up some of the valuable oxygen there, should you shoot him? <laughs> and I thought there's something wrong with the society where that's one of its mm -hmm. main moral questions. Anyhow, it was because of my deep concerns about nuclear weapons that I went to Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. And then I was astounded in Hiroshima to find that nobody had really studied yeah, it. Uh, yeah. I mean, that was a a real insight of a kind of its own and people resisted it and also the Japanese were so overwhelmed by it they some came to help but it was hard to to study it in that kind of atmosphere mm -hmm. and I, I was I was just then um, just then received a, an appointment to Yale and I was able I, I'm, I'm eternally grateful to Fritz Redlich, who was the chair of the department then, when I wrote to him saying, look, I'm supposed to come to Yale now, but I, I, I've discovered this um, situation in Hiroshima that nobody has studied. I really want to stay here and study it. And almost by return mail, he wrote back saying, okay, I've arranged for a modest research grant. You can stay there. And, and I stayed there for six months and did the work. But that was my second study, and I had the sense I had done one which had been especially intense uh, in that sense, an extreme historical situation. And I could do this as well. I knew something about Japan. I was concerned about these questions. I had a little experience. I felt I could do it. Uh, I wasn't without doubts, but I felt I could do it. So one builds a sense of self that one is the kind of person who just might be able to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And that's how it happened. Uh, with a lot of anxiety along the way about whether I could carry it through or sometimes in response to others who thought it seemed a little crazy for a psychiatrist to be out there doing such things. But nonetheless, one develops a sense of oneself or one's own identity as one who can and wants to do that kind of work. In a, in a volume called uh, Explorations in uh, Psychohistory, uh, which is a, a collection that you edited, uh, referred to as the Wellfleet Papers, you laid out a research agenda in, in the early 60s and you, you pointed to uh, an intellectual theme that really interested you and which you thought was coming to be more important and that is really man and women confrontation with the issue of their own death 
and the continuity of life. Uh, tell us a little about your turn to that. Obviously, in the work you were doing in Hiroshima, that problem was posed rather starkly. But it's a theme that recurs again and again, even up until your most recent book on the Japanese terrorist group. Yes, well, um, as a theme in my work, it really developed directly from my Hiroshima experience. Prior to that, I had been under the influence, much to my benefit, of Eric Erickson, whom I met very early in my work and who took an interest in my work. And, uh, and, and I used a lot of his concepts of identity or ego identity in uh, the analyses that I applied to my first book on Chinese thought reform. But when I went to Hiroshima and began to study or just listen to people's descriptions of their work, it was quite clear they were talking about death all the time, about people mm -hmm. dying all around them, about their own fear of death. And when I brought back that work to write it up, I realized that neither in Erickson's work nor in any place in psychoanalysis or psychiatric uh, theory was there much about this, about death-related concepts. Freud was very concerned about death, but it didn't fit into his particular structure, except in a very broad and vague way with the death instinct. So I began to try to formulate uh, a new, but as I say, very old kind of model or paradigm of life continuity or death and the continuity of life as a basic model within, all of which, with, within which all of us live. It was necessary to do to understand Hiroshima, but as I did that, I realized that the symbolization of life and the symbolization of death is what we're all about, not just Hiroshima survivors. And uh, I see that, as I said in that paper that you referred to, as the most useful kind of model or paradigm for any kind of historical work because all historical groups are working within some sort of struggle f around their people, about their experiences that have to do with life and death rather than the more classical Freudian model or concept of instinct and defense. And, and you write in that essay uh, uh, addressing yourself to a concern with the incapacity to feel or to confront certain kinds of experiences due to the blocking or absence of inner forms or imagery that can connect uh, with experience. You go on to speak of the more fundamental process of creation and recreation of images and forms within the mind. And why has that become such a central problem in our time, do you think? Well, I came upon the idea of what I call psychic numbing. At first I called it psychic closing off in trying to understand what Hiroshima survivors were describing to me. They would say such things as the bomb fell or there was this, they would describe the experience they had and I saw this array of dead and dying people around me and I saw everything but suddenly I simply ceased to feel anything. Mm -hmm. And some use the metaphor of a photographic plate that was overexposed. Uh, it was as though the mind was shut off. Mm -hmm. And I came to call that psychic numbing. And then uh, when, I ta when I thought about that, I began to wonder not just about those who exposed the atomic bomb, what about those who make not just atomic but nuclear weapons, hydrogen bombs, mm -hmm. And I thought about the psychic numbing involved in strategic projections of using hydrogen bombs or nuclear weapons of any kind. Uh, and I also thought about ways in which all of us undergo what could be called the numbing of everyday life. That is, we're bombarded by all kinds of images and um, influences, and we have to fend some of them off if we're to take in any of them or to carry through just our ordinary day's work or really deepen whatever we have to do or say. And yet, it isn't all negative. For instance, um, I realize that if you take the example of a surgeon who's performing a delicate operation, you don't want him or her to have the same emotions as a family member of that person being operated on. Uh, there has to be some level of detachment where you bring your technical skill to bear on it. 
And from that, I, I, I formulated a, a model for um, professional work that I saw myself working at, and others too, um, of a combination of advocacy and detachment. Uh, and, and the detachment involved could involve selective professional numbing of that kind, but one's advocacy was right out there as well, as was mine, in studying as accurately and as rigorously as I could the effects of the atomic bombings, but at the same time coming to that study as a person very worried and critical about nuclear weapons. Now, in, in speaking of this problem of dealing with death and the, the realities of, the new kinds of realities w that we're creating in our world with things like nuclear weapons, uh, the, what is available to terrorist groups in the way of biological warfare. You talk about in, that in previous times that we've had various ways of dealing with this, this problem of our own death uh, and uh, through children, uh, through the notion of life after death, uh, through our good works, uh, our creative products, uh, through identification with eternal nature. But you, you point to the notion that, that in our time, uh, what you call experiential transcendence uh, seemed to be on the horizon more than it had been in the past. Well, what I was talking about there was um, how all of us, not just religious people or people who think philosophically, but all of us need some sense of being part of something that precedes and extends beyond what we know in some parts of our mind, however we may deny it, to be our limited lifespan. As human beings, we are the animals or the creatures who know that we die, however we fend off that knowledge. Uh, and being part of something larger than ourselves is what I call the symbolization of immortality, and that can be done through biologically our children or our works, our influences in the world, or through being bound up with eternal nature, um, and uh, also through some sort of religious belief system. But all these are in some way called into question, both by the rapidity of historical change where we lose a clear sense of value structures or uh, belief systems, and also through the existence of ultimate weapons or what I call imagery of extinction mm -hmm. that accompanies ultimate weapons. Every adult in the world has some sense that he or she might be obliterated at any time by these weapons that we have created. And that, at least, it doesn't destroy our need for symbolic immortality or our ways of expressing it, but it does cast doubt to these ways. And I think that's why we, we tend to then embrace what I took to be a fifth form, which is the experience of transcendence or seeking high states whether it's through meditation or drugs or some, something that takes us beyond ourselves or into something like what we call ecstasy, which can be in quiet or very dramatic ways. And, of course, we, we have seen much of that, uh, not just in the 60s in this country and afterwards, but I think continuously. And I think that nuclear weapons have something to do with it, uh, importantly, and so does the speed and confusions of historical change. And then a third dimension that relates to both of these is the mass media revolution, which uh, feeds us with so much in the way of imagery, as we were discussing before, that uh, we become ever less certain of what structures we want to stay with or believe. And in the book on the Vietnam uh, veterans, you, you talk about confronting these realities, reordering the images within your own mind, and then seeking a renewal of both the self and, and the institutions around you. Yes. Um, I learned a lot from Vietnam veterans, especially as some of them turned against their own war. And I found that, uh, you know, a, a lot of these young men, they're all men in the groups that I worked with and some other professionals, uh, they, uh, they had been uh, the, you know, used to the idea that when your country calls you to the colors, you go. They were patriotic, uh, and they had a kind of macho feeling that war was a kind of testing ground for manhood. And also, um, the idea that in many cases they'd literally sat on their father's knee. He had been a veteran of World War II and told them about the glorious victory, and they wanted their moment. Uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, with war glorified sometimes in that way. But when they experienced their first deaths, uh, sometimes that they had brought about in Viet Cong or the enemy or else saw Buddy shot up next to them, but were in some way involved in a death encounter, their comfort in all this was shattered. Uh, in many cases, they, they simply could no longer justify their being there, and they felt everything there seemed strange mm -hmm. and bizarre and for many of them wrong. There was something wrong or dirty about that war, and there were many atrocities that they witnessed or participated in. So an encounter with death could um, threaten one's entire belief system, and then one had to struggle with what one learned, what images came from that encounter, reorder them, put them back into some kind of structure that one could use, which is a whole restructuring process of the self, and then there could be a process of renewal. And uh, that's what a number of the Vietnam veterans whom I and others worked with in so-called rap groups and individual mm -hmm. exchanges were struggling to do. You, you write somewhere, for any experience of survival, whether of large disaster, intimate personal loss, or more indirectly severe mental illness, involves a psychic journey to the edge of the world of being. The formulative effort is the survivor's means of return. Yes, uh, I've been very preoccupied with the survivor all through my work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when we talk about all this in retrospect, it all sounds very logical, mm -hmm. uh, as though one just, you know, wafted through it. It's not that way at all in the way that it happened. You struggle, or I struggled with each of these uh, studies, and I was uncertain about what they meant and often confused, and then I try to put together what I was seeing, and the survivor has been a very important leitmotif all through them, and the survivor is re really double-edged, and that's what I was saying in what you just quoted. I mean, uh, survivors can go one of two ways, or usually both ways. Um, one is having touch death. Uh, they can close down and remain numbed, and really uh, be incapacitated by what they've been through, mm -hmm. or they can confront in some degree what they've experienced and derive a certain amount of insight and even wisdom from it that informs their, their lives. And I think that great achievements have, have occurred in relation to survival, and including uh, spiritual and religious moments. And uh, so there's another dimension of the survivor. And then in, in work that's both very early and very recent uh, on the protean self, um, I, I try to evolve a, a kind of concept of the self that can move from survival or from a death encounter into uh, various kinds of imagery and uh, many different, uh, absorbing many different images and forms and taking in even seemingly contrary dimensions. But the general idea is that one can use a death encounter and recreate oneself in relation to it. And I've seen this happen in various people whom I've interviewed. Uh, Vietnam veterans were very striking in this way because um, as we ran these rap groups, we could see them undergoing changes, and they were changes about their views of the war and war making and about macho and maleness uh, and about really their ideas about life itself. It doesn't mean they were changing entirely. Some things, of course, remain the same, but very important aspects of themselves were changing within months or even weeks, not years, some over years as well. So uh, this was very important for me to grasp, and, and it, it influenced everything I did subsequently. Now, your, your next major book, was, uh, which we have here, was on the Nazi doctors and medical killing and the psychology of, uh, of uh, genocide. And in the introduction to that book, uh, you tell of a rabbi who came up to you at a lecture and said, Hiroshima is your path as a Jew uh, to the Holocaust. Uh, in retrospect, was he right? And then tell us, uh, please. Well, he was, um, he was a he was a friend as well as a rabbi, and, and it wasn't at a lecture. He, he actually visited me mm -hmm. in my home, and, and in a way, 
I think if it happened as a, at a lecture, it might not have made the impact on me that it would as a friend sat mm -hmm. uh, next to me at a table just as we're sitting here and said that. And it, I had a very complicated feeling. I was annoyed by it because uh, as I wrote, it seemed pontifical even for a rabbi who was supposed to, I guess, pontificate. Uh, but I didn't entirely disbelieve it either. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, I came to see that uh, the combination of my being a Jew and the Holocaust and its influence on my life very early on affected my way of responding to nuclear weapons and the Hiroshima experience. And these are very different events, but they're both massively destructive and deeply dangerous to humankind and really to the continuity of all human life. Uh, so in that sense, they blend. And uh, I came to think he was more than a little correct in, in what he said. And the fact is that after I did the Hiroshima work, and, um, and especially after the work on Vietnam, where in that case, the, the men I interviewed were, were, or worked with in the rap groups were both perpetrators and victims. That was the idea. Uh, th they were really responsible, or some other GIs, for um, atrocities in Vietnam in a war that should never have happened, as they felt and I felt. Uh, but at the same time, they were victims in that they were sent there ignorantly, and, uh, and they suffered and had all kinds of psychological after effects from it. And uh, they, uh, they, they taught me a lot about the capacity for change. And from that process, one could see really uh, new kinds of self taking shape. So later on, I wrote about the protean self, even though I'd written my first essay on the protean self, way back in the late 60s, maybe published in early 70s, um, which I derived from my early work on Japan, but I wasn't ready to write the whole book until I thought it through much more. And that I published in, I think it was 1993, a long time later. And, and in this work on the Nazi doctors, you, you really, your, your, your focus on historical processes and psychological processes come together as you account for the way the medical profession participated in uh, the extermination of the Jews at the Auschwitz camp. Uh, let's talk a little about uh, the psycho-historical principle of the Nazi regime and how it combined with the psychological processes within the doctors which you call doubling. Well, one reason that I embarked on the study of Nazi doctors was that in this personal journey uh, I had the feeling increasingly that I did want to do a Holocaust study and uh, and that increasingly I wanted it to be of perpetrators which I thought was more needed. I was uh, involved with ideas about survivors but a lot of work had been done on them and very little on the psychology of perpetrators. And so when, you've moved from survivors to perpetrators. Of that's evil. right, yes. that in, in studying Nazi doctors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when somebody, in fact, uh, who, who had been my editor part of the time for my study of Hiroshima survivors, uh, called me up and said he had some interesting materials on a, a trial of doctors that involved mainly doctors in Frankfurt and wanted to show them to me. Uh, I, I really uh, jumped at that opportunity to make that the beginning of a study of Nazi doctors because they were revealed to me to have been very important in the killing process. And the way that I came to see it as I studied it more was that the Nazis really viewed, especially Hitler and his inner circle, their whole movement as, a, as mainly biological. Uh, one Nazi doctor whom I interviewed told me, he said, he put it in words like this, I joined the, day, I joined the Nazi party the day after I, I heard a speech by Rudolf Hess in which he declared National Socialism is nothing but applied biology. And the applied biology for the Nazis was finding some way to heal or cure the Nordic race. The, the, the idea was, uh, partly in Hitler's writings, the Nordic race was the only creative race that could create culture. The other races could sustain it, but not 
created and the Jewish race quotes was a culture destroying race but the Jewish race had infected the Nordic race and something had to be done to get rid of that infection uh, so this is in a sense a, a biological kind of process and I called it in my work a biomedical vision at the heart of Nazism and and that was a major reason why they focused so centrally on the doctors as a group which Hitler emphasized very early on were especially important to the whole Nazi project and it turned out to be that way as I found in my work and and so that this this Nazi ideology that you could uh, describe in a sense lifted up the doctors but internally uh, w tell us a little about this process of doubling and how healers became killers at the Auschwitz camp. Well, one, um, one dimension was the, was the large psychohistorical dimension we just talked about, that biomedical vision. But the other dimension was what you're raising now, the nitty-gritty way in which a doctor who's trained to heal instead becomes part of the killing mechanism. A lot of things made it happen, and there is a process that can be called socialization to evil. So Nazi doctors join the party, seeking, uh, joining in the promise of revitalization that Hitler offered, and uh, they often, uh, well, that's joining the medical profession, which is a group of its own, and then the military, and then uh, being sent to a camp. All those were groups they became part of and were socialized to. Uh, socialization to evil I discovered is all too evil is all too easy it's evil as well but it's all too easy to to accomplish now these doctors had not killed anybody until they got to Auschwitz mm -hmm. so they weren't extraordinary killers to start with they were ordinary people who in that way was socialized to evil and a key mechanism in that socialization to evil was what I came to be called doubling and one can understand that if one sees that these Nazi doctors were at the heart of the killing process in Auschwitz. They did selections, they selected in the camps, uh, they were in charge of declaring people dead. In a sense, they ran the killing process, although their assistants more and more did it for them. So when they were in Auschwitz, they had an Auschwitz self, which was responsible for doing all this, as well as for the very vulgar life that one led in Auschwitz, very heavy drinking and vulgar jokes and the whole uh, combination of things that made up Auschwitz. But they would go home to their families from Poland to Germany for weekends or for leaves, and they would be ordinary fathers and husbands, where they would function in a relatively ordinary way, calling forth a non-Auschwitz self or a prior, relatively more humane self. And each of these selves functioned as though it were a separate autonomous mm -hmm. self. Mm -hmm. And that's why I called it doubling, even though, of course, they were part of the same overall self. And doubling, it, it, it has more to do with the work of Otto Rank, one of the early psychoanalysts, than with Freud himself. But that kind of process is talked about in his work and in some other early psychiatric uh, practitioners but, uh, and psychological practitioners. But um, it became a mechanism of socialization to evil, as I saw it in Nazi doctors. And, of course, it was a very worrisome kind of insight because it, it, it didn't have to stop at Nazi doctors. It certainly was uh, embarked upon in many ways by Om Shinrikyo, the destructive, uh, murderous cult, which I studied more recently. So it can be used by anyone, so to speak, as a form of socialization to evil. And they don't necessarily call it that, but that's what happens in effect. And, and your newest book is about the Om Shuriko, uh, the Japanese uh, terrorist cult that uh, uh, set about to uh, gather an infrastructure that uh, in, in, in the end was ready to call for uh, destroying the world uh, in order to save it. And uh, 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 you say no individual self is inherently evil in the Nazi book, murderous or genocidal, yet under certain conditions virtually any self is capable of becoming all these things. What, what is, is it fair to say that what you find particularly disturbing in looking at this terrorist group is you see a lot of the same themes about 
purification, uh, destruction, and apocalypse in order to save the world. But, but in this case, it's no longer the state that's behind the scenes, as was the case with the Nazi doctors, as was the case with the, uh, uh, the, the, the atomic weapons establishment, but rather cult groups that acquire access to biological and nuclear weapons. Yes, in, in the case of Om Shinrikyo, um, they weren't at the beginning by any means uh, clearly a terrorist group. They were uh, one of the Japanese so-called new religions and there are an extraordinary number of new religions ever since the middle of the 19th century and especially with a, a new rush, uh, what they call the rush hour of the gods after World War II and then in, again intensely after 1970. So, uh, and young people and not so young people were drawn to Om Shinrikyo because it gave them strong religious satisfactions. Mm -hmm. and, and Asahara Shoko, the guru of Om Shinrikyo, uh, was a very talented religious teacher and a very gifted teacher of yoga, as well as a self-promoting con man. Uh, one can be all these things in the same sense of self. And uh, to some extent, some of these uh, disciples who uh, underwent these mystical experiences with the help of all sorts of meditation practices including sustained rapid bleeding, uh, breathing, which brings about a kind of deoxygenation and uh, lends one really vulnerable to um, high states and mystical experiences, they became very attached to the guru and to this kind of religious practice and they could in a sense turn the other cheek or um, numb themselves to evidence of violence within the cult that they didn't want to see because they were so drawn to the cultic experience. And in that sense, they could form both an Om self, which was thriving in Om, and a non-Om self or anti-Om self, which had doubts and even uh, antagonisms, but which had to be suppressed because such doubts within that guru-dominated cult were taboo, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly these young people were not inherently evil any more than the Nazi doctors were inherently evil. Uh, they were socialized in one way or another into a group that became evil, and the young people in Ohm didn't even know that Asahara was stockpiling these chemical, and, and uh, with the help of his trusted high disciples, uh, biological chemical weapons and attempting to obtain mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. In all of these works, uh, you do extensive interviewing uh, uh, with the Hiroshima survivors, with the Nazi doctors, with the cult members. Uh, tell us a little about the complexity of that process. On the one hand, you have to imagine yourself in their situation, and on the other hand, you have to distance yourself from it to understand it. Well, the first thing I would say is that I found, uh, I mean, I was trained uh, in interviewing uh, in, uh, in my psychiatric residency, and uh, it's a kind of modified psychoanalytic interviewing in which you evoke the life experiences of the person you're talking to. And uh, so for me, early on in my work, the interview was, was a very central kind of instrument, if that's the word. Uh, but as I've used it over the years, I think it's a beautiful instrument, and I think that it's underused. It can be used by almost any kind of researcher, in, in, uh, and that can be in the humanities as well as, um, you know, in social science or any kind of investigation. And um, I found that it, I wanted to modify it very much because, after all, these weren't people who came to me for help. Mm -hmm in my sense of having been trained as a clinician, rather I went to them seeking some knowledge of their experience really. So I tried to make it more of a, a dialogue of a give and take in which they could ask me questions about my life and uh, at the same time I was probing what they were telling me. And I think it requires a, a kind of a double level in which um, one is constantly a human being in a, in a dialogue and, and is not immune from very human questions as, as you might if you're distancing yourself as a doctor who's on a level above the patient you're talking to. But at the same time you are bringing to bear, or I try to bring to bear my 
professional knowledge, my psychological knowledge, um, in order to grasp what they're telling me. Uh, you know, I describe in my book on Hiroshima how in the first days of those interviews I was stunned and overwhelmed by the, the stories they were telling me and I thought, yes, this is a worthwhile study, but can I really do it? And then I noticed that after a few days or a week of doing the study, um, I, I found myself less affected and more able to think about the categories of response that I was hearing. And that I came to call selective professional numbing. I needed at least that to be able to do the work at all. But I realized it was kind of a danger because it's usually overweighted in a lot of professional practice on the numbing side rather than the exaggerated feeling. Uh, but either one can prevent one from undertaking these studies. But the interview uh, has to be, above all, a kind of human exchange. And I think I, I learned more over time from practice uh, and found that uh, people derive uh, a great deal of value and um, take to interviews uh, when they're on this level of give and take because it's an examine for them to it's a it's a chance for them to examine their own lives and and that was even true of former Om Shinrikyo members who had to first have my trust as they were working their way out of this cult mm -hmm. in a way psychologically but uh, they told me in most cases they derived a certain kind of value from it because they could explore what they had been through in ways they hadn't otherwise been able to do uh, we have time, unfortunately, for only one more question, and I want to ask you about what lessons uh, uh, we might draw uh, from your extraordinary body of work about man's, on the one hand, man's capacity to survive, and on the other, man's man and women's capacity to survive, but also man and woman's capacity to do evil. Well, you know, m my work is full of study or recording of evil. It's, it seems to be uh, all too frequent, all too readily called forth, and people all too readily socialized to it or able to adapt to evil. At the same time, I've also seen the other side of it, uh, survivors able to bring knowledge from their ordeal, re create themselves with the help of others and with the help of love around them. Uh, so I am careful not to insist upon a single kind of lesson from all this. I would say for me, uh, and I consider myself neither an optimist nor a pessimist, but to simply confront and make my way through these dreadful events is an act of hope and in recording some of what people were able to do in spite of their exposure to them, also an act of hope. So uh, I, I consider myself still a hopeful person, and I think all of us have to work to combat these events and take steps to prevent their recurrence in some kind of spirit of hope. That's what I try to convey uh, to my students and to others whom I share these, these matters. And, and I would uh, throw at you a quote from your own writings, one looks into the abyss in order to see beyond it. You know, that's very much the spirit of, of my work. Uh, you look into the abyss, but you don't want to be stuck there. Otherwise, your imagination is deadened and defeated by the very event you're studying. Uh, so you want to look into it in order to see beyond it. If you don't look into it, you're, you're ostrich-like. If you get stuck there, you're incapacitated. So you want to look beyond it to other human possibilities. Uh, Dr. Lifton, thank you very much. I've never had the feeling in one of these interviews that I would like to go on for another hour or two, but in this particular case, as in others, I can't do anything about it. But, but thank you very much for uh, sharing with us uh, the story of your intellectual journey. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.